Welcome to my history channel. This is not the kind of history you would normally find in a textbook. I am interested in the deep structures of power. In my first book, The Freemasonic Revolutions I wrote about one of these power structures, Freemasonry. In my second book, The Banking Revolutions, I investigated about a different brotherhood, the group of international bankers that marked the course of the 20th century. I am interested in these hidden episodes of history, because they give a new meaning to the history we read in the textbooks. They allow you to see the full picture. Today I will develop on the real reasons behind the success of the Russian Revolution of 1917. And the main reason was not the rebellion of the proletarian masses, exploited by the czars and the capitalists. The key element was the interest of the German intelligence in driving Russia out of the World War I. The German capital of the Kaiser made possible the revolution that in 1905 had failed. It's not pointless to mention here that Germany, since 1914, was at war with France and Britain in the Western Front, and with Russia in the Eastern Front, as well as with other minor countries. By helping the Bolsheviks to collapse Russia in 1917, the German intelligence removed an important piece from the chessboard. Almost all the protagonists of the Russian Revolution are well known. In the 19th century Marx and Engels picked up the baton of the French Enlightened philosophers and established the ideological foundations of a new revolution. Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, with their charming oratory and sharp pen contributed in Russia as did Mirabeau or Merit in France. It was Stalin, a man of gunpowder and bullets emerged from the lower strata of the party and reached supreme power. He prevailed much to the surprise of his rivals, all of them more educated and intelligent men. His violent means allowed him survive in power for 30 years in a political movement fundamentally ruled by violence. But all revolutions, including the communist revolution, needed capital. This is the story of the real protagonist of the Russian Revolution, the hidden prophet Israel Helfad, the man the party needed to do the dirty job. His name is barely mentioned among the protagonists of regime change in Russia because of his shameful implications as a spy and collaborator for the Germans, who actually provided most of the funds for the Bolsheviks. Helfand's importance surpasses all the Bolshevik leaders, he became the major source of income, intelligence, propaganda and logistic support for the communist movement. Helfad, known by his alias Parvis, was born in 1867 in a wealthy family residing in Minsk, although he immigrated during his youth to Odessa. In 1886, at the age of only 19, he left the Russian Empire for the first time to study in Switzerland, first in Basel and then in Zurich, where he received his doctorate in philosophy. Helfad embraced the socialist doctrine in Switzerland and in the following years his promotion of this ideology caused him to be expelled from several cities. In 1900 he changed his place of residence to Munich, where he met Lenin. His apartment in Schwabing, the Bohemian district of Munich, became a meeting point for revolutionaries in exile. He lodged Trotsky and his wife in his apartment, and it was there where Rosa Luxemburg met Lenin for the first time. Helfad actually persuaded Lenin and the other editors of the Iskra revolutionary newspaper to work from Munich. Christian Rykovsky, a prominent Bulgarian socialist and later a business partner of Helfad gave them false passports to reside there. Rykovsky was the son of a Bulgarian landowner. He eventually became president of the Soviet of Ukraine between 1918 and 1923. Rykovsky was one of Trotsky's closest allies too. Helfad came to Russia after the establishment of the Petrograd Soviet in 1905 and published there the Financial Manifesto where he fostered the Russian population to start an economic and tax insurrection. He demanded the Russian people to stop paying taxes to the czars and to withdraw all their deposits from the banks. Shortly after, he was arrested with Trotsky and the other Soviet leaders, and he was deported to Siberia. Like many of his Bolshevik comrades he easily escaped across the German border on his way to exile. He could never return to Russia. After a long experience collaborating in socialist publications, in 1910 Helfad arrived in Constantinople, where he began to amass an important fortune. Little is known about the origins of the money, although the most common speculations related him to the arms trading for the interests of the German Krupp and the British Vickers, who did great business in the Balkan War. Christian Rykovsky, an educated man well used to the area, became his right hand and his chief agent there. 
Helfond's experience and his network of contacts allowed him to provide supplies, financing, contacts and intelligence to the Young Turks, a revolutionary movement that deposed the Sultan ruling the Ottoman Empire. His influence in this movement grew and he became the editor of his newspaper Turk Yurdu in 1912. By that time the existing nationalisms in the Balkans were clashing with the territorial ambitions of the European powers and the internal tensions in the Ottoman Empire. The Balkan War from 1912 to 1913, anticipated a much greater conflict between European powers. After the assassination of the Habsburgs heir in Sarajevo in 1914, the World War I began. The stance of the Socialist International was favorable to peace. Marxism proclaimed quite accurately that the war was a struggle of an elite of capitalists sustained with the blood of the proletarians. Helfad, however, publicly demanded Turkey's support for Germany, explaining the advantages this would bring for the country. He also published articles in Bulgarian and Romanian media, neutral powers at the beginning of the First World War, calling on the socialists to unite against Russia, and therefore in favor of Germany. Rakovsky also promoted the German cause in both countries with a great success, Bulgaria entered the war on the side of Germany, and Romanian support to the Entente was delayed. Rakovsky was arrested in Romania at the end of 1916 for exercising anti-war propaganda, and after the rapid defeat of the Romanian army he reappeared in Stockholm in 1917. The German intelligence, which facilitated its transit to Stockholm, later stated that Christo Rakovsky, a Romanian socialist born in Bulgaria, runs a Russian socialist newspaper in Stockholm. Formerly, he was connected with us and he was working for us in Romania. During the Great Purge of 1938 Rakovsky was judged for conspiring against the revolution, helped by foreign powers. Rakovsky acknowledged having worked for the British Secret Services since 1924, and the Japanese since 1934. Rakovsky rejected having collaborated also with the Germans, but we know Rakovsky lied. Why would a Bolshevik get the support of Germany? Neither Helfad nor Rakovsky owed any allegiance to the German cause, they despised the Kaiser Wilhelm II as much as they hated his cousin the Tsar Nicholas II, but the Germans were necessary travel companions for the Bolsheviks. For Bolsheviks, the triumph of the Entente, the Franco-British-Russian coalition, would mean the triumph of Tsarism, and for the Germans it would mean a total military defeat. The chances of a German victory vanished with the entry of Russia into the war, and their only hope was to establish a peace on the Eastern Front. That would only be possible if Germans were able to drive Russia into a total internal crisis. Bolsheviks used the crisis of capitalism as a tool to carry out their own social revolution. By supporting the Bolsheviks, the Kaiser little cared about the fate of his cousin Nicholas II, as the Duke of Orleans did not care about the fate of his cousin Louis XVI, when he voted to guillotine him during the French Revolution. Author Zibinek Zeman brought to light the documents of the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. These documents found in the archives of the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs reveal the role of Helfad as a proxy between the German intelligence and the Bolsheviks. In January 1915 Helfad managed to attract the attention of high German officials. He met in Constantinople with the German ambassador, Baron Hans von Wangenheim, and Helfad expressed the identification of the Bolshevik cause with the German cause. The interests of the German government are identical with those of the Russian revolutionaries. Russian Democrats could only achieve their aim by the total destruction of Tsarism and the division of Russia into smaller states. On the other hand, Germany would not be completely successful if it were not possible to kindle a major revolution in Russia. Helfad was introduced to the German government by Ulrich von Brockdorf Rantzau, then ambassador of Germany to Denmark. In February 1915 Jago, the German Secretary of State, invited Helfad to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Berlin, where he held a meeting with high-ranking diplomats. Helfad promised a strike in Russia for January 1916, coinciding with the anniversary of the Great Strike of 1905 that paralyzed Russia during the war with Japan. Helfad delivered a memorandum to the German ministry with a detailed plan to establish anarchy in the Russian Empire thanks to the Bolsheviks. He promised they would carry out a campaign of revolution, sabotage and strikes. Its plan contained precise instructions for each region of the Russian Empire, for the adjacent countries and even for the United States. It also contained recommendations to handle the matter in the press. This list an extract of the technical preparations for a rising in Russia, the document in which Israel Helfad exposed to the Germans his plan to send Russia into chaos. 
Bolsheviks would need a provision of accurate maps of the Russian railways, showing the most important bridges which must be destroyed if traffic is to be crippled, and also showing the main administrative buildings, depots and workshops to which most attention should be devoted. b. Exact figures for the amount of explosives required to achieve the aim in every case. Here, consideration must be given to the shortage of materials and to the difficult circumstances in which the tasks will be carried out. C. Clear and simple instructions for the handling of explosives in blowing up bridges, blowing up large buildings, etc. D. Simple formulas for the preparation of explosives. E. Preparation of a plan for resistance to armed forces by the rebel population in Petrograd, including special consideration of the workers' quarters, the defense of houses and streets, the construction of barricades, and defense against cavalry and infiltrating infantry. The Germans immediately understood the military advantages that Helfand's plan could bring and soon provided all the economic and logistical support necessary to carry it out. Letter from Froelich, a German public officer to Diego von Bergen, German minister to the Holy See Berlin, 26 March 1915. The Deutsche Bank has sent me the transfer note for a further 500,000 marks, which I enclose herewith. I should like to draw your attention to my letter of the 20th of March, in which I observed that Dr. Helfad requires a total of 1 million marks, excluding losses incurred in exchange, and that any such losses incurred in Copenhagen, Bucharest, and Zurich, together with any other expenses, will thus have to be borne by us. I would therefore ask you to make the necessary transfer to the Deutsche Bank so that I may be able to pay Dr. Helfad this difference also. Yours, Froelich. Some months later the sum sent to the Bolsheviks increased by another 5 million marks. Letter from the State Secretary of the Foreign Ministry, Gottlieb von Jago, to the German Treasury. Berlin, 6 July 1915 5 million marks are required here for the promotion of revolutionary propaganda in Russia. As this sum cannot be covered out of the funds at our disposal, I would like to request Your Excellency to put it at my disposal by charging it to include it in the extraordinary budget. Jago. This request was granted on July 9. In addition, another 2 million were required, and later another 15 million marks. Letter from Kuhlmann, an officer of the Foreign Ministry to the German Treasury Berlin, 9 November 1917. On the basis of the discussions between Minister von Bergen and Ministerial Director Schroeder, I have the honor to request Your Excellency to put the sum of 15 million marks at the disposal of the Foreign Ministry, for use on political propaganda in Russia, charging it to the extraordinary budget. Depending on how events develop, I should like to reserve the possibility of approaching Your Excellency again in the near future with the request that you agree further sums. Signed, Kuhlmann. The request for additional funds was confirmed and the door remained open for future sums of money. Letter from Bush, a German public officer to the minister in Stockholm, Brockdorf Rantzau. Berlin, 10 November 1917. Half of desired sum will be taken on Sunday by Feldjäger. Remainder on Tuesday. Further sums available if necessary. Signed, Bush. Helfad estimated that 20 million rubles would be necessary to carry out the revolution. Author Zibinek Zeman gives account in his work of more than 20 million marks, and considers the number would be close to 30 million marks. The German weekly Der Spiegel quantified German support for the Bolsheviks in at least 26 million marks. The Germans were very disappointed with Helfad when no major strike occurred in 1916, and they ceased their economic support. They even suspected that part of the money sent could go directly into Helfand's pocket. However, the Bolsheviks were successful and the strike came a year later than promised. The German-Russian business operations of Helfad continued during that time. Helfad was already a full-fledged bourgeois, a very successful one. He combined its commercial operations with the acquisition, financing or controlling a wide network of socialist publications throughout the world. The list of newspapers that he came to control include Turkish Homeland in Turkey, and also Internationale Correspondence, Social Science Studies, The Bell, and Reconstruction in Germany. He also subsidized and provided support for other publications of Russian socialists in exile, such as Trotsky's newspaper Nash Slovo, or Lenin's, Isra. Helfad settled in Copenhagen in June 1915, where he also founded the Institute for the Study of the Social Consequences of War. 
Far from being a historical research center, the Institute acted as a center for publications related to the interests of the revolution, a front for managing the money obtained from Germany and a recruiting center for young socialists in the Nordic countries. Helfad attracted to his institute the Ukrainian socialist Moise Aritsky, who years ago was in charge of transporting the newspaper Pravda to Russia, a journal that Trotsky edited in Vienna. At that time he also had the help of a Polish socialist named Jakob Fersenberg, whose adopted name was Hanetsky. Fersenberg was his correspondent in Russia when Helfad founded in Germany an import-export company called Handels Og Export Company, trading and export company. He traded mostly with Russia, and the protection of the German government ensured Helfad an excellent profit. He dealt in a variety of goods, from stockings and contraceptives to raw materials and machinery. Helfad procured copper, rubber, tin, and corn for Germany's war economy, while exporting chemicals and machinery to Russia. Some of the goods were covered by export licenses, others were smuggled. The experience of Fersenberg with Helfad was very useful to him, and when the revolution triumphed the Bolsheviks put him at the head of the Soviet National Bank. While in Copenhagen Helfad developed a close relationship with Brockdorf Rantzau, who was then the German ambassador in Denmark. This German officer became his greatest supporter in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. As we know later on, in 1919, he was the man in charge of negotiating peace in Paris. In fact, all relevant men in the post-war German period knew the unspeakable pact between Germans and Bolsheviks, but none of them mentioned it in their memoirs. Foreign Minister Brockdorf Rantzau, who negotiated the Peace of Paris in 1919, Kaiser Wilhelm, President Ebert, President von Hindenburg, General Ludendorff, Finance Minister Matthias Erzberger, who signed the Armistice of 1918, and future Chancellor Scheidman. They were well aware of the deal with the Soviets. Banker Max Warburg, the Kaiser's closest advisor in financial matters and in intelligence was also part of the plan. Max also happened to be the brother of Paul Warburg, the mastermind behind the Federal Reserve and Woodrow Wilson closest financial advisor. The reasons for the German silence is quite evident. The socialist agitation that they created in Russia later turned against Germany, which almost fell into the clutches of communism too. The Spartacist uprising of 1918 was another Marxist revolution led by of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in Germany. It was suffocated, but it caused 1,200 deaths in Berlin and 10 times that amount in the entire country. Also, if the people of Entente countries or Russia knew that the Bolsheviks were agents in the pay of the Kaiser, their plan would be in jeopardy. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs gave clear instructions to suppress any information on his collaboration with the Bolsheviks, in the local or foreign press. The Russian newspaper Reek for 20 July announced that two German general staff officers called Shidiki and Lubers had told a Russian lieutenant, by the name of Jermalenko, that Lenin was a German agent. It also said that Jacob Fersenberg and Dr. Helfad Parvis were German agents acting as intermediaries between the Bolsheviks and the imperial government. I consider it essential, first of all, to discover whether these German general staff officers, Shidiki and Lubers, in fact exist, and then, if at all possible, categorically to deny the report in Reek. Signed, Brockdorf Rantzau. The response to the publications that linked the Kaiser government with the Bolsheviks were quickly suppressed. The suspicion that Lenin is a German agent has been energetically countered in Switzerland and Sweden at our instigation. Thus the impact of the reports on this subject supposedly made by German officers has also been destroyed. Signed. Bush. Helfad became a very important figure in Germany, and he was an advisor to President Friedrich Ebert on Russian affairs and other matters. His actions in support of the revolution paradoxically made him an outcast among his comrades. Helfad was seen as an amoral, traitor, millionaire and a true merchant of the revolution, who represented the opposite of what international socialists pretended to be. Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky, Lenin and the others turned their backs on him. His dispute with the socialist writer Maxim Gorky greatly contributed to this. In 1902 Maxim Gorky, the great writer of the proletariat, shared with Helfad the copyright of his literary works in the West. They agreed to share one-fifth for Gorky, one-fifth for Helfad and three-fifth for the party. His work was a worldwide success, but by 1905 neither Gorky nor the party had received any money. The party estimated that Helfad owed them some 130,000 German marks. 
The issue was settled with Helfad within the party, but his reputation remained tarnished forever after that. Helfad was an uncomfortable element for the revolutionaries but he was necessary perhaps the only one critical for the revolution, as a fundraiser. When the German foreign ministry put at his disposal one million German marks, he urged his agent Christian Rakowski to distribute the money obtained among the revolutionaries emigrated in Paris. While Trotsky was living in New York, he claimed to have received most of his funds for the revolutionary newspaper Nash Slovo from Rakowski, although from his tribune Trotsky openly attacked Helfad. Lenin also received a priceless support from Helfad in Munich. It was not very likely that Trotsky or Lenin ignored the origin of the two dozens of millions of German marks that paid for the revolution. Stalin probably discovered it some years later, and this was probably one of the chief reasons for the purge of Trotsky's supporters and other original Bolsheviks that could endanger the very same foundations of the revolution. Helfad, the amoral millionaire, merchant of the revolution, died in 1924 of a heart stroke. Exiled from Russia, despised by his own Bolshevik comrades, abandoned by his former German allies, and ignored by history. The life of Israel Helfad proves that the communist revolution was founded on a lie, and succeeded thanks to the betrayal of the Bolsheviks to Russia, conspiring with enemy nations to collapse the old empire. The first success of the Marxist doctrine in Russia spread across the world like a virus, creating totalitarian regimes, causing widespread poverty, killing millions and becoming the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. You can find all the bibliographical sources and more information in my book The Banking Revolutions. Remember you can find many other extraordinary episodes of history in my books The Banking Revolutions and The Freemasonic Revolutions. If you like my work please, like, subscribe. Buy my books in Amazon. Or support me in Patreon. Thank you.